color can be a key factor in determining a gemstone's value and identity. But where do gemstones get their color? Why aren't they just brown or gray like other regular rocks? It's a simple sounding question with an answer more complex than you might think. For starters, let's talk about how we see color in the first place, our eyes. Our human eyeballs are pretty miraculous. When light enters the eye, it comes in through the pupil and hits the retina, triggering photoreceptors. Those photoreceptors send an electrical signal to the brain, and the brain decodes that signal, telling us what we see. There are mainly two types of photoreceptors in the human eye, rods and cones. Rods make up the majority of our photoreceptors and are used in low light situations. They're so sensitive to light that they can be triggered by a single photon. They're also responsible for our peripheral vision. Cones, on the other hand, are situated primarily near the center of the back of the retina and give us great visual acuity. That's why we see things in greater detail when we're looking directly at them. Our cone cells come in three varieties that react to different wavelengths of light, which is why we can see color. Hats off to cone cells. All right, now that we understand how we see color, let's talk about what color actually is. I just mentioned how cones detect different wavelengths of light, but what does that have to do with color? Well, our cones react to a range of wavelengths of light from about 400 to 700 nanometers. Every color we humans can see falls somewhere on that spectrum, which we call the visible light spectrum. Some animals, like dogs, have two types of cone cells, so they can see fewer colors than we can. Other animals, like bees, have four types, and they can see more colors than we can. And then there's the mantis shrimp. These guys have 12 different types of cone cells. How crazy is that? They can see infrared light and ultraviolet light. I can't even imagine what that looks like, but it sounds seriously trippy. Anyway, when you combine all those wavelengths of light between 400 and 700 nanometers, you get what we call white light. If you're wondering what that looks like, just check out the sun. No, I don't mean stare into the sun. I mean go outside and look around. Everything is illuminated by the white light of the sun. You may also notice that there are lots of different colors to see out there. Here's why. When white light made up of all those different wavelengths of light hits an object, whether it's the grass, the birds, or rough gems, some wavelengths of light are absorbed, others are transmitted, and others are reflected back. Those wavelengths of light that bounce off and find their way into your eye tell your cones that the leaves on the trees are green and the hair on my head is brown. Color is essentially modified white light. The closer to black an object appears, the more wavelengths are being absorbed that never reach your eye. That's also why a black car gets hotter in the sun than a white car. It's absorbing a lot of energy. Now on to the million dollar question. Why is ruby red? And why is emerald green? And what is going on in a colored gemstone? That's where color gets a little bit more complicated. Just like in other colored objects, gemstones absorb certain wavelengths of light while reflecting others. In gems, transition elements are usually responsible for their coloration. Titanium or cobalt create a blue color, chromium can cause a red or green color, and copper is responsible for the blue of turquoise. For some gems, their base chemical makeup defines their color. Malachite without copper is no longer malachite. These are called idiochromatic or self-coloring gems. Some gems, on the other hand, are colored by trace elements not essential to their chemical composition. These are called allochromatic gems. The presence of coloring agents is considered an impurity, a lovely colorful impurity. For example, Ruby's chemical composition is Al2O3, but it's the presence of chromium that gives it its beautiful red color. On the other hand, Sapphire's chemical composition is also Al2O3, but it's colored by iron and titanium. And if your mind isn't already blown, some gems exhibit color change, which is a display of different hues depending on the temperature of light. In the most famous case, alexandrite, 
you have a gemstone that equally reflects the red and blue portions of the visible light spectrum. When the gem is exposed to warmer light, it will appear red, and when exposed to cooler light, it's going to exhibit a bluish green. Of course, as with much of science, the explanation is much more complicated than that. While the transition element principle provides a good basis for understanding the causes of color, the real subatomic mechanisms behind it are mainly theorized. What they all have in common, however, is that some form of energy from incoming wavelengths of light is absorbed, and the residual reflected wavelengths that meet your eye determine the color of a stone. Transition elements are not the only source of color in gems. Sometimes it's defects or vacancies in the crystal structure that affect how we perceive the color of a gem. Colorful optical effects, such as iridescence, can also be caused by a gem structure. Opal, for example, is composed of stacked silica spheres, the size and arrangement of which influence how light interacts within the stone. As light passes through and between these spheres, Diffraction and interference occur, causing the rainbow play of color that Precious Opal is famous for. So, to review, you need three things in order to see color. Light, a gemstone, pick your favorite, and at least one good eye. And I guess the more cone cells, the better. Speaking of cones, what do you think the mantis shrimp vision is like? Let me know down in the comments and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss out on future episodes. Thanks for watching.